You might hear me, Father Yahweh, this is Kohan Michael Hawkins asking, can before you being seed of your last day's witness, Israel Abel Hawkins, and through your son, Yeshua Messiah, the high priest of your house, thank you, Father, for all things that you've given to us, and as we rehearse the words of our beloved past and overseer, Israel Abel Hawkins, Father, we ask and pray that you continue to bless him and strengthen him. Help us, Father, to retain these things and to learn and to grow stronger and, and closer into you, Father, to the perfection that you desire. We do bless you. We thank you, Father, for all things you've given to us. We ask these things in unity with the body of priests. Through your servant Israel Hawkins and through your beloved son, Yeshua Messiah, the high priest of our great house. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Please be seated, men. Let's see. We left off on page 221. My book is in shambles. Okay. 221 here. It talks about the Holy Cross and says, why the Holy Cross in this present century? Why did that have to take place now, you know, in this time period? And that's what a little bit that we'll be looking at here. It says, the prophet Isaiah was inspired to write about Yahweh's plan to establish his house again in a prophesied time period called the last days. The last days. And Yahweh, of course, describes the events that would take place during this time period in great detail and there's a lot a lot of different information that you find in the writings of the prophets concerning the last days and he continues in these prophecies and talks about the names of these two brothers that Yahweh would use to establish his house and give him two witnesses remember in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word be established so you have two witnesses you actually have four right you have the two witnesses and you have Yahweh and Yeshua as being in the four witnesses there and this is Yahweh's house even without Yahweh you still have three witnesses with the two witnesses and Yeshua being the third witness to show that it is Yahweh's house so Yahweh would establish his house in these last days and of course he was established it in a, in, in a land that hadn't yet been discovered and that's described in detail by the prophets as well so it could be easily identified. Now, the nation described, of course, is the United States of America. And it was a land that, that was not yet discovered until thousands of years after the prophecy was written. And that's the amazing thing is the prophets wrote these things. And at the, during the time, you know, the prophets, when they wrote things, they didn't see these things fulfilled in their lifetime. It was for others, others to see. In fact, there's some prophecies that, that, that uh, took place you know, a, a short time, say a, a few hundred years, uh, and maybe some some of them, a few that was less than that time period, but the majority of them was for much later time, the last days, thousands of years later. And Yahweh described this in detail for us, and, and he prophesied this time period that's called the last days, and he described it as a time when mankind would have the ability and the technology to destroy all life on planet Earth. Now think about that. This type of, uh, of technology and the increase in knowledge had never taken place. For thousands of years, man used the things that Yahweh made on this earth. And it wasn't until these last days, in the, in the last 100 years, that technology has gotten to a point to where many of the things that mankind normally would do has been taken away from him. And of course, this is all part of uh, Yahweh's plan to allow Satan also to influence mankind because when technology comes and your job, certain jobs are taken away, then that allows more free time for a person. Well, the more free time a person has, if it's not used properly, then of course it's used to promote sin and to be influenced to sin. And of course, that was exactly what Satan loved about all of this and she uses technology for for that advantage in order to teach against the laws of Yahweh and in, and in order to allow people to desire to want to have that time to do these things now here it says Yahweh described for us in detail the prophesied time period and in Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 4 it says the word that Isaiah son of Amos said uh, saw concerning Yad and Jerusalem now he sees this concerning Yad and Jerusalem and that's what people overlook you know 
they, when they look at these prophecies, they don't realize that it's, he's telling you about God in Jerusalem. What's going to take place with these? Verse 2, it says, It will come to pass that in the last days that the, the house of Yahweh, the, the mountain, the promotion of the house of Yahweh would take place. This promotion, this lifting up as a mountain is. Would be, that the house of Yahweh would be established in the chief of the nations and be raised above all congregations and all nations will eventually flow to it. Now, you know, now we're the least <laughs> of all beliefs on the face of this earth. We're the least, you know, but we have the smallest following of the house of Yahweh compared to the religions of this world. But this is a promise that Yahweh says that eventually all nations are going to flow into us. And, you know, it, it, it's astounding when you look at it because, it is, remember, Yahshua called us a little flock. And he said, you know, be faithful, he says, and, and joyful will you be, you little flock, you know, that you will inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. So, and, and little means least, least in number, least in mount, least in influence, you know, the, the smallest, the minutest. And that's the way that we are. But yet Yahweh has a plan and just like Yeshua said, the kingdom of Yahweh is like a little tiny mustard seed, which is very tiny when you hold one in the palm of your hand, and yet it grows into the, one of the largest trees on earth. And as he says, it would be a nest for all different types of birds and stuff. So this is a, a promise that Yahweh has given it to us. And it's in the chief of the nations, okay? The United States is the chief of all nations. It's the most powerful nation on the face of this earth. And many people would go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the promotion of Yahweh's house, the house of the father of Yahweh, of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law will depart from Zion, and the word of Yahweh will depart from Jerusalem, notice. So it's not, no longer going to be in Zion, on Mount Zion. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. He plainly tells you it's going to depart from there. And that's exactly what verse 1 talks about. Yada and Jerusalem, Okay realize that this will no longer be there. So it's not going to be, the house of Yahweh is not going to be built up in Jerusalem anywhere, in the quote-unquote holy land. It's going to be a very holy land once the bombs go off and they have holes all on the ground. But it's not a holy land in, in the eyes of Yahweh. Yahweh removes himself from there. You remember what the prophet says in, in, in uh, Isaiah about how that Yahweh would remove his name from the mouth of Yada, that no man in Yada would mention his name any longer. So he would remove these things. And so, and then Yahshua said, it would be moved from another place. Remember, given, it would be taken, the kingdom of Yahweh would be taken from you and given to another nation, a foreign nation of people of the same habit, those who would be keeping the laws of Yahweh. And so that's exactly what's taking place. And he would judge among the nations and rebuke many people. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will no longer lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. Then there's another prophecy that says they're going to take their plowshares and beat them into spears and beat them into swords and so forth. Showing that they're going to go into war first. Then this prophecy would take place where they would take those same weapons and make them into weapons of peace. I always used to think of that way back in the news, back when um, the U.S. and Russia was, you know, talking about they were disarming and doing away with some of the old weapons and stuff. And I remember reading an article before about how in Russia they were taking the tanks and they were selling the tanks off and disassembling them and selling them off. And the farmers would buy these tanks and hook plows on them and use them in their fields as tractors because there they were shortage of tractors. And so they would be using these weapons of war, you know, actually to be used in, in, in the fields. Well, these last days are described by Yahshua Messiah and these other prophets as a time period, a time period. Now, and that's where Yahweh worked. He always worked with certain periods of time, okay? It was a time period when man's technology would be greatly increased or advanced. This would occur many years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE. Okay, so this was after this time period. And, and the destruction of the temple, remember, was 
a prophecy that Yeshua used to get the people to realize that they and, and understand that they can believe what Yahweh says. They can believe the prophecies. It did come to pass. It was after their time period, but it did come to pass. Now, Yeshua went out. Here's Matthew 24, verses 1 through 6. Yeshua went out and was leaving the temple. And when his disciples began to show him the temple building. Remember that. The temple building. But Yeshua said to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I say to you, there will not be one stone left sitting on top of another which will not be thrown down. Now he's talking about these stones, but notice what it says in verse th verse 1. It's talking about the temple. Okay? It's not talking about the western wall. It's not talking about any structures that may be still partially stone upon stone that's laying on top of the temple mount right now. It's talking about the temple. You don't see any stones of the temple remaining on the mount right now. They've all been knocked down and they've all been carried away and done with whatever they did with them. Okay? In direct fulfillment of what this says. Now I say that because some people will, will look upon the western wall and other parts and say, well, hey, you know, that prophecy wasn't fulfilled. Look, there's still one stone left upon another. You know, and it shows their foolishness because they don't read what the scripture says. Verse 1 plainly tells you he's talking about the temple building. Okay? And it has been torn down. Now, verse 3, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, which was just a little ways outside of the, on the other side of the wall there, outside the temple area, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Well, we know that, don't we? We've seen that. We've seen that prophecy. Partially come to pass, anyway. The sign. Now, Yeshua answered and said, Be on guard, so that no man deceives you. Deceives you what? Not to believe. Not to believe all that the prophets have spoken, okay? And many will come against my name, saying, I am anointed to preach salvation, and will deceive many. And it's not just the fact that they come against the name Yahshua, and say that the name of Yahshua should not be used, but it's against his authority. Remember, name, the word name means authority. Many would come against my name, meaning many will come against my authority. They would deny who Yahshua is, and he is the son of Yahweh. And he proved himself to become the high priest over the house of Yahweh. So if, if Yeshua would not be the high priest, we would have no house of Yahweh in these last days. There'd be no need to establish a house because we still need a high priest. And Yahweh waited 2,000 years before he ever established a house to have uh, a high priest over them. And that, of course, was in these last days. For many will come against my name saying, I have, I'm anointed to preach salvation. Yes, I have authority to do this. And they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And see that you're not troubled after all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Even though you hear these wars and these rumors of wars taking place. Which you hear all the time in the news. You know, the, 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 the nations are angry as it says in Revelations. But the end is not yet. Now notice, there's three questions that the twelve disciples Ask Yeshua here in verse 3 concerning these last days, this time period called the last days. One was, it said, when will these things be? Another one was, what will be the sign of your coming? And three, what will be the sign of the end of the last days? Now, when will these things be? Well, Yeshua said the temple would be destroyed, leaving not one stone left upon another, as he says in verses 1 and 2. Now, both the prophets Jeremiah and Micaiah were inspired to write that Zion would be plowed like a field. And they further explained that though the temple had been destroyed twice before, never had it been so totally removed as it would be at this present time, okay, at this prophesied time that this took place. And this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 CE, exactly as it was prophesied. The temple was destroyed. Now, before that, the temple was destroyed, but it was ransacked and burnt and all that kind of stuff, okay? And, and even some of it torn down. But it had never been completely wiped out like this prophecy says it would be. 
The temple was destroyed because when it says that Mount Zion would be plowed like a field, they literally hauled in dirt to cover this area so that they could plow it. Because they didn't, Titus didn't want anyone to even possibly even remotely think anything that a temple had ever stood there. And so it's just like the prophet said, it would be plowed like a field. Now, the temple was destroyed, it was plowed like a field, and to remove any evidence that the temple stood in the location under the direction of the orders of the Roman general Titus. Now, isn't it strange though, that some of this very same action was taking place by the United States government in Waco, Texas in 1993, just four years prior to the writing of this book. Now, according to the reports, they burned the church and the homes of the Branch Davidians with the members inside, and then the land was bulldozed to cover up any sign that a church and those that kept the feast had ever occupied that land. And if you remember, they had signs out there talking about the feast. You know, they used Yahweh's name. They were called Branch Davidians, and if you remember the history of that, the pastor actually was warned by people who he knew and they said that this was going to come upon us that that was intended for us but Yahweh had his protection for us now they you can't see those pictures there but you know they did wipe it out they bulldozed it down and they ended up burying it and trying to get rid of the evidence and so forth now this was the branch Davidians if you remember um you remember what this prophecy talked about? Now, Satan, she knows some things. But remember, the sacred things belong to Yahweh. But she's in, in Zechariah 3, verse 8, it says, Hear now, O Yahshua, the high priest. Yeah, I'll put this on the screen. Oh, you better read that. Okay, hear now, O Yahshua, the high priest. You and your companions who are before you. Uh, okay, these men wondered at it and said, Behold, I will, send, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Okay, now remember, these were known as the branch Davidians. Okay, the, the, the branch Davidians. And then um, in Zechariah, let's see. So, Zechariah 6. Verse 12, too, you remember he says, This is what Yahweh of hosts says, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He will branch out of his place and build the house of Yahweh. Okay, well now they did use the name Yahweh. Okay, and as he says, this branch would come forth from David. So she thought, okay, let's go after this place because this is the branch Davidians, okay? Um, in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. Okay, verse 2, it says, uh, In that day will the branch of Yahweh be beautiful and glorious, promoted to honor, and the fruit of the earth will be excellent and coming to those who have escaped to Israel. Okay, remember the fruit of the people. The fruit of the earth of the people in Zion are those who keep the laws of Yahweh. So she's thinking that these branch Davidians is the place that she needs to go after. And so Satan, you can tell that this was allowed by Yahweh, of course, but this was definitely inspired by Satan as she was allowed to go in and inspire the people and go in there and do such a thing. Because, you know, there was abundant proof shown uh, in, in, the, in the videos and stuff that was shown showing what took place and how these people had planned these things out and went in there and they didn't have any mercy upon these people you know the, and, and what they did is they ended up burning them to death you know so this was Satan's way now she thought about those things but she didn't understand all of these prophecies you know and this is of course Satan's attack to try and make people doubt prophecy too because you know her uh, her mind in her mind if she, if she can wipe people out and get rid of the evidence which is what she was trying to do then she could keep the people deceived um, 
in, let's see, you're in me 23, verse 5. It says, Behold, the days come when Yahweh, says Yahweh, that I would t raise up a, to David, okay, a righteous branch. And that's where she got her mind into the, the Davidians, the branch Davidians. And the king will reign and succeed. Okay, well, she didn't know that part. <laughs> that's where her mind was confused of what was going to take place. But she thought about these branch Davidians. Let's see, in uh, uh, Isaiah 44, uh, verse 28. Where are we at? 44, 28. It says, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, it says, uh, the one having, the one saying for uprightness. Now, the one saying for uprightness, in the King James, that says Cyrus. Okay? And Cyrus, in Hebrew, is is Koresh. David Koresh was his name, right? So, she thought of this scripture here, that the one saying for uprightness is the way it should be translated, the one being my shepherd, who is Israel, who will accomplish my purpose, and say to Jerusalem, you shall be rebuilt into the house of Yahweh, you shall be established. Okay? So, she didn't know these scriptures fully, of course, that was Yahweh keeping her from knowing these things because the gates of hell will not prevail against his last day's house. But she knew it enough to try and go in there and to cause this disruption. That's why you remember she went after Moshe. She did the same thing to Yeshua. Okay, so any time that there, in, in, this, in these different time periods, any time that there's a way in which she thought that she could possibly destroy and ruin the plan of Yahweh, because remember, as Yahshua said, if heaven and earth could be destroyed, then, you know, that would be it. The plan of Yahweh would be, would be done. It would be over with if Satan could, could accomplish that. But she can't. But in her mind, she thinks she can, and she desires to do whatever she can. Okay, the second thing here on page 224 is, what would be the sign of your coming? Well, Yahshua said that many would come against his name, his authority there in verse 5, and this prophecy has been fulfilled because the names of the Creator Yahweh and the Messiah Yahshua were removed from the pages of the Holy Word. Okay, and they're replaced, of course, with the titles of gods, El and Elohim, God, Adonai, Lord. That in no way, of course, refer to Yahweh and Yahshua, but as a result, the true names of Yahweh and Yahshua were totally forgotten by both the Hebrews and the Gentiles alike. Absolutely no traces of the holy names were left. And even the names and the names of the places that were derived from the holy names were erased, including the name of the most well-known temple of Yahweh's chosen people, the House of Yahweh. Remember, it used to be called the House of Yahweh in Solomon's time, but then, of course, it became known simply as the temple. Now, this whole world has turned completely to the worship of gods. If you remember in... Uh, 2008, the Vatican directive was that Yahweh is inappropriate for liturgical use. I just want to read a couple of things here that was in that article. It says, the Vatican has ruled that the name of God commonly rendered as Yahweh should not be pronounced in the Catholic uh, liturgy. Now, I like that, commonly rendered as Yahweh. <laughs> Go ask a Catholic if they know what the name of the Creator is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's commonly rendered by those who know his name as Yahweh, okay? And then it says, in place of the name of God, pious Hebrews used the four letters, tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, or they substituted the term Adonai, or the Lord. The first Christians continued this practice, the Vatican notes. Yes, they did. The first Christians did because they were the ones who were responsible for doing this. They came up with their God, Jesus Christ, or gods, two, two gods in one. You know? She chewed bubble gum, too. Okay. The effect of the Vatican directives should be evident in the selection of hymns since some contemporary liturgical music violates this policy of pronouncing the name of Yahweh. In other words, some of the hymns had the name of Yahweh and they had to take it out. I don't ever remember hearing the name of Yahweh, though, growing up in the Catholic Church. The policy also calls for some care in the preparation 
of variable elements in the liturgy, such as the prayers of the faithful. And they want to make sure that no one used them in the prayers. That's for darn sure. Okay. Now, if you remember in Revelation 17, 17, 3. Okay, but it says, It carried me away in the spirit and midst of the God worshipers. Okay, the worshipers of Elohim. Okay, which we just read about. They did away with the name of Yahweh. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast, which we know is a Catholic church, full of names of blasphemy. Okay, full of names of blasphemy. Now remember what Yahweh says in um, Isaiah 52. The prophets wrote all about these things and made it very, very clear for people to be able to understand these things. In Isaiah 52, verse 5, notice what he says. He says, Now therefore, what have I here? Says Yahweh. That my people are taken away for nothing. Well, they're taken away there's nothing. It's the gods, okay? And those who rule over them make them well, says Yahweh. Notice they rule over them or they lord over them. The lords who, who enforce the name of the gods. They rule over them and they well, says Yahweh. And my name is blasphemed continually every day. Okay, it's blaspheme. It's the same thing that you see there in Revelations 17, 13. The name's full of blasphemy, okay? They have done away with the laws of Yahweh. They have done away with Yahweh's name and caused the people to forget my name through their dreams, okay? Through their dreams. They would have these things that they would dream up in their own mind, Okay, and go out and teach this to the people. Now remember the strong deception and the things that took place because of the fact that when, you know, people were born, generation after generation were born being told these lies. And then you remember in, in Prophet Eremia says the time's coming when the people will say, the people, the Gentiles, it says, will wake up and they will say, well, we have inherited nothing but lies, Right? And so they're going to realize, the time is going to come when they're going to realize that they've inherited nothing but lies. But Yahweh's plan is just. It's fair, you know. And he, in his plan, is that the whole world would be deceived by Satan. The whole world, except for a select few that he's calling out. So the world is the world. And that's why it says, come out of her, my people, because we are a select group of people, a very, very, very small amount of people compared to the seven billion people on this earth. I mean, when you think about you're one out of seven billion, that's a pretty strong odds. You know, there's no lottery tickets that's that much, you know, one out of seven billion. But we are. And Yahweh's chosen that for a reason. He, he's, he's got us so, he's got the whole world deceived. Keep them blinded, because you remember as it says in the prophet Isaiah, he says, well, you know, he keeps their minds blinded because if they went out and you taught the world and the people understood it and then they, then they realized, they would convert. Anybody out in the world right now would convert. That's why the peaceful solution works when it goes out and the people hear it and Yahweh opens their minds and they accept it. Because the people would convert, but if they did, it couldn't bring Yahweh's plan to pass. They've got to be deceived right now. He has to have them deceived so he can prove us. There's a select group of people that he's trying to prove and get ready to become like him. Because remember, he's not only looking down upon the earth, as it says from heaven, as, as the scriptures talk about, but he's also looking out throughout the universe. He's seeing all this hatred, all of this despising, all the... The, 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 the fightings and so forth and the, the destruction of the things that he created. How do you think that makes him feel? And he sees the despisement that's in the hearts and the minds of all of these beings that's out throughout the universe in hatred against him. But yet, this has got to be. But he can deal with it. And he does deal with it. And that's the way that, that you see the example you see in Israel Hawkins. All that he's been through, you'll never hear him talk about it. You know, you'll never hear him talk down to anybody. He's always done. He knows that it's Yahweh's will. He accepts that. And he gladly goes through whatever he has to go through with the hatred that's there. Well, Yahweh's trying to teach us that same way. We've got to become like him. 
So we have to have to live in a world where the whole world is deceived and hating us so that we can become like him. Now, it's not going to be that way forever. You know, I mean, it says that, you know, you can't say that Yahweh's plan is unfair. It's not. Because the scripture says that right now their minds are blinded. It's not, they're not open. But the time will come where their minds will be open. Now, just like we see all the things that's going on, we're capable of seeing and understanding the things that's taking place in this earth right now, the reason for the diseases, the reason for all the things that's taking place is because of sin. When sin is in the life of people, the curses come. The people of the world don't understand that. So they have to go through it, and people have to suffer horrendously, and they have to die in these diseases, and die in these horrors, and die in abortions, and so forth. But the time's coming when they will be resurrected, and they will have their minds open. And then, just as we learn right now, and we're suffering, and everybody in the house of Yahweh is suffering through different things, we're suffering to learn, because remember, Scripture says it's beneficial that we are afflicted. And boy, I always got to constantly remember that, okay? We, it's beneficial that we are afflicted, okay? Because we suffer. But it's to remind us of the laws of Yahweh. It's to remind us what sin does in this world. Now, we have to go through that, and we're learning that lesson. And as we learn that lesson, then we become more like Yahweh, and we desire more to be like Yahweh, and to be delivered from this, and to realize that this is what sin is, and we don't want to have any more to do with it. So that when our change comes, we will not desire to want to go back into the world. Well, those who have lived, are living now and have died and so forth, they're going to be resurrected. Their minds will be open. And then they will realize and be taught and understand, that's why I had to suffer in that life. Boy, it sure feels great to be alive today. Because I'm not having to go through all of that stuff. And they'll be taught, remember, for a thousand years. And then they'll be let loose and say, now... Make your decision what you want. And then it's going to get almost to the point, remember Satan's going to be let loose, and then it's almost going to get to the point to where a nuclear war will break out again. But then the eye will say, nope, that's not going to occur again, and stop it. And then those who have chosen that way, that's the way you won't. You'll be destroyed because I'm not going to let you get to that point. I'm not going to let you live any longer in that state of mind. And he would destroy them and get rid of them. And that's righteousness and that's justice. Because just like Yahweh allowed the children of Israel to go out into all the nations and fight. And he said, when you go into a place, you go in there and you wipe it out. You kill man, woman, child, beast, everything. And you burn that city and you completely destroy it. Because he knew that the animals were defiled. He knew that the women were defiled. He knew that the boys were defiled. He knew that the men were defiled. He knew everything. He knew the defilement that was there. It tells you, plainly tells you in Leviticus 18 and 20, all of these things and the ways in which these nations before them were defiled. So this was not something where he was a mean old God, go out and kill and wipe out your enemies and take over the land. That's what God teaches, and that's what the Catholic Church did through the Crusades. But Yahweh didn't do that. Yahweh says, you go... If these nations come out, wipe them out, so you can put them out of their misery. That was a mercy killing. He allowed them to die to get out of their misery. But of course, they didn't do that. They didn't go in and conquer like they should have and taken over these areas and wipe this out. Otherwise, they could have set up the kingdom. But it was too early to set up that kingdom. But they were given the opportunity Time after time after time, they were given the opportunity to establish the kingdom of Yahweh, but they chose not to do it. And of course, that was all part of Yahweh's plan because it had to be in these last days for it to take place. Okay, let's see. Um, now, the third thing was, what will be the sign of the end of the last days? And of course, Yahshua answered that too when he said, that many would be deceived. Now, we talked about this Holocaust. Why this Holocaust in this present century? Well, it's a sign that, of the end time, that many would be deceived. Now, the prophet Daniel, the prophet Daniel prophesied that the religious leader, whom all the governments follow today, 
that he would speak out against Yahweh. He would speak out against Yahweh and anyone who followed his law. He would, in fact, he would change Yahweh's laws, his holy Sabbaths, his feast days, and Yahweh's laws, statutes, and judgments in the hearts of the people. Now remember, Yahweh's writing his laws. The covenant is made to write his laws in the hearts and the minds of the people. But now here we have this religious leader who has the audacity to come in and to actually change that in the hearts and the minds of the people. Now you can't change Yahweh's law. Okay, Yahweh's law is Yahweh's law. It's forever. You can't actually change that law. But you can change the way that the person thinks about that law. And that's what he, he was accomplished in, in the minds of the people. Through fear, through intimidation, through death. And how did they do it? They wiped it out by the traditions of men. Remember, Yeshua had to fight off the traditions of men. In Daniel 7, 25, it says, He would speak great words against Yahweh. And would wear out, that is, mentally attack and cause to fall away the saints of Yahweh. And that's what they did with the Crusades over and over and over again. And they would think to change the times, Yahweh's feast days and his laws. And they would be given to his hands until a time, times, and a dividing of times. Now, this Roman Catholic Church, you know, they openly admit to changing Yahweh's laws. They don't try and, and do it, you know, they don't try and get out of that. They, they plainly tell you. In fact, in their writings, they say, why was the Sabbath changed to Sunday? Because we did it. We did it. We had the power and authority from God to do it, and so we did it. And that proves that we are the universal church because God didn't stop us. He didn't strike us down, so that meant that he gave us the authority to do this. And they openly admit it in those, those exact words. Now, the fact is that the Catholic Church, they had the authority to change Yahweh's laws in the minds of the people and to teach these traditions that was based upon these pagan practices instead of it. Because you've got to remember, you've got to have something to replace what you take away. If you don't, you would leave the, the minds of the people empty. Okay, They have nothing to do. So therefore, if you take away righteousness, you, there's this void. And you've got to fill that void up. So they took these pagan practices and played on them and rearranged them. And when they went, remember, when they went into a certain territory and the pagans were worshiping certain gods and had certain traditions, they didn't go in there and force them to stop doing what they were doing. Instead, they went in there and said, oh, okay, you worship Saturn. Okay. Well, here, I want you to worship it on this day. Here, this is the day that you worship them on. Turn into Saturn Day, you know, or Saturday as we know today and so forth. And the sun god was worshipped on Sunday. And the moon god was worshipped on the day of the moon, you know. And so they went in there and they took these things and they changed them. And this is how they got about with Christmas and stuff. And then as time went on, they took these little traditions that they had, you know, to... Because it's only for the children, you know that, right? It's, I mean, all of, these day, all of these days are only for the poor little children. You know, all the little children, they got to have something to do. You got to bring joy in their life. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it just brings a big old smile to your face when you see them rip open that present. Then they take it and they smash it against the wall and you think, I just spent 150 bucks for that thing. You know, but, you know, it, it's for the, the, they do it to deceive the children. Why? Because the children are the next generation. So they're going after the next generation. You know, they... They, they don't have any concept of what they're doing, but Satan's very crafty in the way she does things. So if she can get at the children, that's going to be grown up. And then you can have more children. You're going to teach your children and so on and so forth. And this is how they perpetrated these lies. And this is how they got all these traditions of men into the minds of the people to where, face it, when you ask somebody, well, what's wrong with that? You know what Christmas comes from? Well, yeah, but that was... That was then. That's not now. We don't do that. It's, it's just for the children. It's just fun, you know. I mean, hey, don't take Jesus out of Christmas. Okay, remember that. It's the Lord's birthday, you know. And, and so their minds are just totally whacked out because century after century after century, and generation after generation after generation, they've learned these things. It's just become the norm. So they don't, they don't even have enough sense, really, to question where do these things come from. And this is what the power that the Catholic Church has. That's what's called universal. They are everywhere. And their influence is there. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Top of page here, 225. Okay, now this is the reason the people in these last days have no knowledge or understanding of Yahweh and his laws. Instead, they have a hatred in their hearts for Yahweh's laws and for his name. The hatred, of course, is not really so much that they, that they hate Yahweh and they hate his laws. It's the fact that they don't know Yahweh. That's why they hate him. It's not just, just not an outright hatred that they have. It's embedded in them that anything that goes against the traditions that they've been taught, it's got to be wrong. Don't talk about my traditions. Don't take these things away from me. This is mine. You know, my, four, my grandfather kept these things, and my great-grandfather, and great-great-great-great, and all, all the way back, you know. Don't take it away from me. And so that's where that animosity comes from and that hatred for these things. It's the hatred for what is right. And that's all we're trying to show them is what is right. Now, it says because of this, they're not even aware of the deception of the gods. Remember, it says their minds are blinded. They don't have any understanding. And that's what we can't forget. It says, remember, only the house of Yahweh is under judgment right now, not the world. The world knows nothing. They can't be judged because they haven't had their minds open. But we have. We have had our minds open. So the house of Yahweh is being judged now for the understanding that we have and what we're doing. But they're not even aware that the gods actually deceive. Their minds are that blinded. Remember, it says their minds are blinded to the light of the message. Wouldn't shine to them. Okay? That light, that understanding of the message. They wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Now, this deception which was prophesied to occur, was aimed at Yahweh's laws of salvation. That's what it's all about. And these laws, however, they're contrary to what Christianity teaches, of course, and they're only the laws that will bring, they're, they're the only laws that can bring eternal life to mankind. And of course, Christianity doesn't bring life. You know, it, it, was, it was a counterfeit by Satan to take the minds off of the truth of Yahweh. And Yahweh says, if we repent of sin and if we obey his laws, then he will give us eternal life. But if we continue in sin, we continue breaking his laws, then we will die. Now, Yekeshka 18 tells us about this. And he says, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, what do you mean when you see or when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, says Father Yahweh, you will no longer use this proverb in Israel. It will be taken away. Verse 4, he says, Behold, all souls are mine. Just as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it will die. It will die. There's no immortal soul. It's going to die. An immortal soul can't die. That's what immortality is, to live forever. And they've always tried to do that. You know, and that's what they, and they get, see, way back, remember, Tommy, the Egyptians, the Egyptians believed in immortality and that the pharaohs were gods and they lived forever and you went to the underworld when you passed away in this life and you lived on in another life somewhere else. But there's no immortal soul. And notice, but if a man is just, Doing that which is lawful and right. Whoa. Notice, if a man is just doing that which is lawful and right, which means there's laws that apply there, if he has not eaten upon the mountains or lifted up his eyes to the gods, now it's not talking about climbing up a mountain and going up there and having lunch, okay? The mountain is the uplifting of the god worship. If he hasn't lifted up the gods... Okay, of the house of Israel. You remember that the scripture says that there, were, there, were, there was gods on every street corner throughout Jerusalem there and throughout the, the area. If he has not defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached the menstruous woman. Now remember, a menstruous woman. Okay, you remember, they have done studies, you know, menstruous blood. On a mouse causes the mouse to be confused. Okay, menstruous blood. If a, if a, if a, if a woman handles seed, plants the seed, the plant ain't gonna grow. You know, and if she handles, if she tries to go and cook and leaven some dough, it ain't gonna leaven because she's touching it. 
because that's the toxins, that's the poisons that's inside of her body. That's what Yahweh is trying to protect us from when he says, keep these laws. But the world doesn't keep them, and that's why they're in the confusion in the minds in which they're in now. In him, he says, um, and has not oppressed anyone, but has restored the pledge, okay, the depth of the pledge. In other words, you're not, you, you know, you're not going to try and get out of what you owe. You're going to pay it back. You're not going to withhold what belongs to someone else. And has robbed none by violence, and has given his food, uh, has given his food to the hungry and covered the naked with the garment. That's the garment of salvation and given him the proper food, allowing him to have the things that are necessary to have eternal life. Uh, and then he has not lent upon usury, nor collected with increase, who has withdrawn his hands from iniquity. Now remember, part of the mark of Yahweh is the mark of Yahweh is upon the, the hands and the forehead, right? The thinking, the logical part of it, the thinking in your minds, the, in the hands, your actions. So if your actions is to depart from iniquity, then of course you have the mark of Yahweh. Okay, here on page 226 now, the Catholic Church has convinced the world that they have authority to write new laws for salvation. That they can just do away with the Bible and they'll write their own laws. And that's what they've done in the hearts and the minds of the people. That's why the Bible is something that you see on a coffee table to prop your feet up on. But it's not to be read. It's just there as a decoration that collects dust. And all that you can keep your old marriage and those kind of records and stuff in there too you know? don't read it well they have deceived mankind into actually believing that all of Yahweh's laws are outdated and they're unnecessary for salvation yeah you know it's like pork pork is okay to eat I mean everybody knows that way back then there was no such thing as refrigeration right Although Yahweh's law says you can cook meat and leave it out for two days and you can still eat it. But you don't need refrigeration. You've got to have refrigeration. You know? And then they say, okay, well, you know, pork, you know, it's like nowadays, man, we have them in nice clean stalls, you know, with concrete and bars holding them in place. And we inject them, pump them full of antibiotics and all this stuff, you know. So, you know, it's okay for them to eat. And we feed them with corn, man. We fatten them up with corn. Hey, not like the old days, you know. So it's sanitary conditions now. You know, they actually take pigs and they will actually, because, you know, pigs, pig organs and stuff is pretty close to humans. That's why they use pig hearts and, and the valves or the heart valves and then put them inside people and stuff. And then when they need a transplant, they take a pig heart and they put them in there. But they'll take pigs and they'll actually keep them in completely sanitary conditions inside of a room inside and they'll keep everything clean and they'll have that, that they have that pig that sows give forth birth and then they carefully remove those piglets and they of course that's when they'll they'll use them to inject human genes into them and so forth and experiment with them because they actually want to turn man into a half pig because of the fact that the pig for some reason the body doesn't reject the pig's organs as much as other animals and so forth so that they'll use this in research but they say that, you know, it's okay to do that in their minds. And then, of course, they think that these laws have been done away with, you know. It's no longer, you know, out of, they're all out of date, so you don't have to keep these things. But you can see the logic and the understanding and the, 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 the knowledge and the, the greatness of Yahweh's laws and how they keep us alive when we keep them. You know, they only bring death if you break them. But the fact is that there's no church, nobody. Nobody has the scripture authority to change or to rebel against any of Yahweh's laws. And that includes the Sabbath, that includes his feast days, all of these things. There's absolutely no authority anywhere in the Holy Scriptures for failing to live by the laws of Yahweh. You can't find an excuse. You can't find an authority to do that. Yahweh says you will die if you do it. Because his laws are forever. Now remember, Deuteronomy 4 verse 2, he says, you shall not Add to the word, which I command you, nor shall you take anything from it, so that you may keep the laws of Yahweh your father, which I command. Now he says, you shall not add to or take away. Because if you add, 
to the law of Yahweh, then you make the law of Yahweh a burden. And that's what they did. Remember, they added all these different kinds of things to it. And, and the law became a burden to the normal person, and they didn't want to keep the law. Now, if you take away from it, then you make the law of no effect. And you can't receive the blessings from it. So, if you make the law a burden, people not want to keep it. And if you take it away, there's no blessings. The, you, you have taken away the blessing of life. These things that would give you life. And then, remember, this is what the scripture says. That, and Yahshua said that. But the laws that I've given to you, these are life. Because that's what's going to give us life. That's what's going to keep us alive forever. Is keeping these laws. Now, right now, we're not in the body form of a body that can live forever because of the sicknesses and the disease and all the things that have taken place that have torn our bodies down. If you continue to live forever in the body that you have right now, you would be in continual aches and pains throughout all eternity. And who wants that, you know? But so Yahweh would change these things. He would change our bodies and give us new bodies. But it's the laws of Yahweh. It's the keeping those laws that's going to keep us alive forever. Because there's life. These are the laws of life. Life, which keeps something living. No death. And that's the beautiful part about it. Now Psalm 119 verse 160 says, Your law is true from the beginning. Beginning. You remember? Genesis. Remember, it was the light of of life as as Yachadine tells us it's the law in in this beginning was the light remember and the light was given to mankind and you read in Genesis where it talks about it was dark and then the light came forth the laws of Yahweh came forth because if Yahweh's laws had not been the first thing that was placed upon this earth the earth couldn't have survived you understand that the earth couldn't survive you have to have the laws of Yahweh to keep everything in motion. That's why it tells us things to eat. It tells us things to wear. It tells us how to live. And everything on earth that's been created on earth has to keep those laws that he set forth in the very beginning. That's why when Yahweh made the seventh day, he continued his work or this whole earth would be destroyed because he had to maintain those things that he set in motion. You gotta remember, the earth was renewed, but you have all of these billions and billions of stars that's out here around here. Everything we look out the nighttime skies, for us, you know, you look out there and you can see light years and light years and light years, you know, billions of light years away. All of these things are out there just to keep us alive. And we can't even see what's in that blackness. But all of that is filled up. And as Yahweh says, he is the father of light. You know? So everything he made is to keep us alive. Those laws have life in them. And it says, your law is from the beginning and every one of them is righteous. Your righteous judgments are forever. Because they tell us. They are judgment. I mean, when you think of judgment, you used to think, you know, about well, somebody goes before a judge and they slam down the hammer and they throw him in jail, you know. But judgment is judge. You judge every day, okay? Judgment is decisions. You make decisions every day with your life. Every moment of your life, you make decisions on what you're going to do next. And so Yahweh gives us his law to guide us. It's, it's a, like he says, it's a constant friend unto us so that we can learn it, we can teach it to others, we can live the example, and we have something that will keep us alive if we'll only follow those things. Now, the Catholic Church, they claim to have the authority to change Yahweh's laws, but it's clear that this authority does not come from Yahweh, you know? So where does it come from? Where would this authority come from? Well, in Genesis 3, verse 5, he says, now remember, this was Satan talking to Eve, and she said, for he, Yahweh, knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods. You will be the Elohim, knowing righteousness and evil. And you know, that is one of the teachings that mankind came forth from the Elohim. The Elohim 
or spiritual beings and they came and they planted the seed of mankind and put them here so that we could become like the Elohim. You know, it's the same thing that Eve was taught. That, you know, Eve, look, Yahweh, you know, <laughs> man, he's so boastful, you know, it's like, he, he, wants, he wants to rule your life, you know. But look, it, it, the gods, we were the ones who really created you. And we can give you the things you need. You know, All you got to do is just follow us. And it's the same lie that has carried on through generation and generation after generation. That if you follow the gods, and remember in the, in the old times, the reason why people follow the gods is because they thought that they were getting something. Remember the queen of heaven? Well, we would worship the queen of heaven, you remember? Get out of here, you know? We haven't seen any bad times as long as we were worshiping the queen of heaven, but then you come here preaching this Yahweh, and as soon as we start pre living by what he says, all our blessings have been taken away. And then Yahweh says in Hosea, he says, but you're too blind and ignorant to understand that I am the one who gave you the blessings of the corn and the wine and the things. But you instead, you said this comes from the Lord, Baal. But he constantly showed us the blessings and the life that would come from his laws. Everlasting life. Now, every one of Yahweh's prophets, his apostles, the apostles of Yeshua, all of them, they were inspired to warn the world about this deception, this instructing everyone to beware of the false prophets and to turn their, that would turn their hearts away from Yahweh. He said, be careful because these false prophets are going to do this but you must be on guard. In Malachi 4, verses 1 through 4, he says, Behold, the day comes who burn them like an oven, and all the proud and all who do wickedly will be a stubble. Okay? Because this is going to be their own doings. And one day they're going to wake up and they're going to realize that this all came because of their own decisions. They don't see that now. Today they think Take it by force. You know, look at these poor people. They're living. We got to go in there and force democracy on them. So we got to go in there and force this upon them. We got to get that leader out of there. And we're going to go force these people to keep democracy. What's well, the same teaching that's always been taught? That's what Adam and that's what Eve was taught. You know, is that democracy would be the way to live. That's what that's the way that Cain chose. And he tried to force this upon the world. The Yahweh has given us a, a, a means by which we can live. And we can live forever. And we're going to, like Yeshua said, we're going to have life abundantly. But we'll be able to live this life forever in peace and joy and knowing these things. And then we'll have the great privilege of teaching others and actually restoring. You know, when we learn about the restoration of the earth and see the earth being restored, and we're going to be learning all of this time. We're going to be learning how to keep control of all of these things and bring everything up to the way it originally was made you know to actually taste food for what food was meant to taste to breathe clean air to see clean water to realize that you could go out to any stream of water and reach your hand in it and drink pure clean water that would give you life instead of the poisons that's out there now and not have to worry about any of these things that's out there you know, and to actually see the creations and, and to communicate like with the animals and see them and not have a fear of any of these things and really enjoy life. And then you're going to be able to go out to other places because every place in the universe, the earth is just one place and the earth is just on display right now. And all those places out there in the universe are looking at the earth and seeing that, yes, that's what we're suffering. And when they see us, remember, when Romans 8, when it says the revealing of the sons of Yahweh, when they see us start to change this world and to turn this world back, and the hearts of the minds of the people begin to change, that's when they're going to know that the sons of Yahweh are revealed. That's going to be your revealing to them. They're going to see you, and they're going to have hope and long for you, as it says in Obadiah, the Savior's to come to them so that their planets can be given back to them in the way that they remember it as well. But we're going to stop here on page 227 so the priest can next week can take over there on the middle of the page of 227. Everybody, please stand. We'll go ahead and close with prayer. 
Let's raise our hands. Almighty Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is Gohan Michael Hawkins asking come before you, being seed of your last day's witness, Israel Bo Hawkins, and through your son, Yeshua Messiah, the high priest of your house. Thank you, Father, for your great blessings of watching over us and giving us life, Father, and giving us understanding of your word. We ask and pray, Father, you help us to remember the things that you brought forth through all your witness, Israel Bo Hawkins, and that you continue to strengthen our minds and help us through another day now, Father, as we proceed forth and that you will continue to give us peace and strength and protection, Father, and allow us to perform your work. We do bless you, we thank you, Father, and we look forward to the upcoming of your Sabbath day soon, and we ask and pray, Father, you be with us and continue to help everyone, Father, to overcome any sicknesses or anything that they're going through and the pains and the sufferings of this life so that we can rejoice before you, Father, as we gather together once again. We ask and pray these things, Father, being unity with the body of priests, through your servant Israel Hawkins and through your beloved son, Yeshua Messiah, the high priest of your great house. We do ask these things. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh.